Hey, hello and welcome to Stan Energy Man on a fun-filled day here in the studio, getting a little bit of a late start. Anyway, I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, and uh, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii and Stan Energy Man show. We've got a great guest today from the Big Island of Hawaii, and we're going to be talking to him, but I'd like to talk a little bit about a great event coming up on the 8th of May uh, here in Honolulu at the Foreign Trade Zone. We've got a Renew Rebuild Hawaii, where we'll be... Uh, talking to some folks from DBED's uh, economic uh, side and get an economic picture of, uh, of energy in the state of Hawaii and what the future looks like. Um, Gwen Yamamoto Lau from the GEMS program to talk about financing energy projects. Uh, I'll be making a presentation on hydrogen. We'll have a, a couple other folks talking about projects on Kauai and some uh, folks from Hawaii Gas talking about their Honolulu Uli, uh, their natural or the renewable uh, gas project they have with the county of Honolulu. So it's a great event. If you got time on the 8th, come out from 8.30 in the morning till 11.30 in the, in the morning and uh, enjoy some time talking about energy. So today on our show, we have uh, Richard Ha from the Big Island. I've known him for about six years, and uh, he was one of the first people I met from the Big Island that works energy projects, and uh, he's our guest today, and it's really good to talk to him. And so, Richard, uh, welcome to the show, and why don't you tell the audience a little bit about what you've been up to your whole life on the Big Island and what's been keeping you busy and getting you involved in energy? Um, yeah, so the, the, the last 40 years I've been involved in farming. I started off with bananas and started off with a $300 credit card when it was difficult to get a $300 credit card. Um, and then we built ourselves up and then eventually uh, moved from uh, where we were in Kapoho to Keao, then moved again to the Keo and uh, diversified into uh, uh, tomatoes. And then about 10 years ago, we noticed the uh, uh, cost of our uh, um, supplies were going up. And, and, you know, and it was um, surprising because it was uh, to do with all, all, all the uh, plastics, the... the um, fertilizers, stuff like that. And it took me a little while to figure out that they were uh, energy related because they were, they were byproducts of uh, petroleum. And once I found that out, I figured I'd better go study uh, what that was about. And, and so I went to the first of the five big oil conferences I went to. So in, 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 a, in a short uh, uh, description, that, that's what's been taking place over the last few years, yeah. So you, you've actually self-schooled yourself on um, the, the amount of energy it takes to actually run a farm when you actually go back into the products that go into farming, like fertilizer, um, energy for your vehicles, your tractors, your refrigeration, because you have food safety issues as well, right? Uh, yeah, the, 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 yeah. Uh, we have to follow all these regulations. But you know what happened to me when I was a kid? Uh, my pop used to tell stories about um, uh, impossible situations, and he would always, you know, we'd be around the dinner table, and he'd pound the table, and he'd say, not no can, can. And I was 10 years old at that time. It effect, affected me really, really uh, strongly. Um, maybe I'll tell another story. And, and our family is Kamaheli from uh, Lower Puna. And so uh, we, you know, the family owned land along the ocean. And I was telling a story about his, him and his friends fishing. Uh, so they had a bamboo pole with a kerosene lantern, and they were fishing, the, the three of them. And he said, white water coming. What are you going to do? He was asking me what I would do if, if, if you know, if they were out on this point, and the white water was going to clean out everybody. And I didn't know what to do. So I, I, so I said, no, I don't know. What, what would you do? He said, you know what I did was I climbed my uh, bamboo pole, hand over hand, lifted up my legs, the water went underneath. Then I dropped back down and I, I fished my friends out of the water. And, you know, and I'm like, wow. And then he looked at me and said, you know what? I knew what I was going to do um, before it happened. So that, you know, it's uh, continuously planning, planning in advance, that kind of stuff. I, 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 I was influenced a lot by, by these kinds of stories. Yeah, that's that's really important. We we forget that if we look back to our kupuna, the the folks that came before us, and, and in Hawaii, if you look back four or 500 years, the population of Hawaii wasn't much different than it is right now, but we didn't have to import food, 
to our Safeway and Costco and things like that. We didn't have to import oil. We didn't have to import a lot of stuff that we import now. It was all sustainable. And I think a lot of folks um, don't have that picture right now. We're so used to using cheap oil and cheap transportation to bring stuff in that we probably should be growing ourselves and that we could relearn from folks like your dad and, and the folks that, that grew up from an earlier time and look back in our history on how we could be sustainable. And I know one of the things that you did on your farm was uh, you had your own hydroelectric at your banana and tomato uh, plantation. So I have a, a picture of your, uh, your um, hydroelectric generator. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that project. Oh, yeah, the, how that came about was, you know, um, 10 years ago when the oil price spiked, we realized that, uh, um, I, I realized I needed to go learn about it. So I, I went to the uh, first of five big oil conferences, and the first thing I found out was that the world had been using twice as much oil as it had been finding and had been doing that for 20 years or so. So when I came back from that first conference, I, I said, you know what? We better go figure out what we can do. And we just happened to have a flume running through our property. Uh, so two things happened. One was I, I went to you know, work with um, uh, the legislators to get a law passed so that farmers could use renewable um, energy and get cheap, cheap loan from the Department of Ag. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was we started to figure out how we we're going to use the, the river to generate our own electricity. So, so the law passed, and I applied for the loan, and then we developed a hydroelectric plant, which can now, which is now generating 100 kW, um, um, just just from the run of the river. And so, basically, the the that was an old sugarcane flume. Oh, yes, it was. Yeah, it 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 it, it might have been around for 100 years. And, and, and it was, you know, yeah. We know that sugarcane was on Oahu and on Maui, on, on probably, uh, and the Big Island, uh, maybe even on Lanai. I, don't, I think they were mostly pineapple. But, you know, there's a lot of, of those flumes and tunnels that, that have been used for a long time in the sugar and pineapple industry. So we could actually be doing a little bit more hydroelectric, maybe even on Oahu, than we, we think of using right now. And, and that's pretty much a firm baseload power, right? That that 100 megawatts just kind of kind of keeps going all the time. It doesn't doesn't uh, change like the solar solar panels and wind. When the wind dies down or the sun goes down, you know you, you can't count on it for energy. But those flumes, um, as long as the water is flowing and you're putting the same water in that you took out, so you're not polluting it or anything. Um, what were the, what was some of the permitting issues that you had with with uh, using the water? Uh, we, we just have to go through the Water Resource Commission and get approved. So, so that that uh, we did that. But what is really good about um, the hydro is that when it's raining and cloudy, you're not normally getting a lot of uh, of solar. So it works when there's a lot of solar. Um, it's not really critical, but when there's no solar. The, the, the rain is falling, and, and, and you, so it works to complement each other, okay. solar and uh, hydro. And does the flume, uh, does it fluctuate much over the seasons, like rainy season to not rainy season, or you get a pretty constant generation? Uh, it goes up and down. It, 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 if there's a drought, it can dry up. Um, but in general, you know, it, it, it's pretty steady. Okay. Let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the other renewable sources that are available on the Big Island. For example, geothermal. Give us a, some background on how, how Puna Geothermal was um, accepted by the community and some of the issues they ran into and maybe some of the issues we can avoid in the future if we want to use that huge uh, natural energy um, source. Yeah, the characteristic of geothermal is that um, we're going, the Big Island is going to be over the hot spot for the anticipate 500,000 to a million years. So, you know, it's kind of sustainable, yeah. Pretty sustainable. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's 24-7, real solid, uh, uh, stable power. So it's just a matter of where you locate it. And, and there's some um, 
Uh, right now, Tuna Geothermal is located close to the East Rift Zone, but there is also geothermal uh, energy on the slopes of Mauna Kea, and uh, there's quite quite a bit of uh, uh, geothermal power beneath uh, 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 Mauna Kea. So there are alternatives. What are some of the concerns, though, about the the folks? I mean, we always have folks that are, you know, don't want things in their backyard or whatever, for whatever reason. What were some of the, the issues that the local community brought up when Puna Geothermal started up? Well, you know, there, there's, there were issues about uh, gases, uh, but uh, the Department of Health actually um, uh, controls the, um, the amount of uh, uh, gas that can be emitted you know, at, at, a nuisance, at, at a nuisance level. In other words, what you can smell is what they, uh, what they, uh, um, um, that threshold. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's the threshold. But the danger is quite a ways higher than that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so th there's not really much danger if you compare it to maybe, um, um, New Zealand or places like that, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, so there, there, there is a lot of concern from the community, but um, if if you look at the the um, the amount of emissions, the kind of emissions, the the, the, the frequency, there, there's a very very little uh, danger as compared to what just happened with this eruption. I mean, the the amount of uh, Hydrogen sulfide that came out is just incredible, incredible, uh, as compared to what um, the, the, the level that the, the Department of Health controls uh, by. Yeah, and that, that brings up a good point. When the volcano recently erupted in, in that area, um, and they had to shut down Pune Geothermal, um, my understanding is that the Big Island lost about 30% of uh, their power generation from that plant shutting down during the eruption. Is that about right? Yeah, it is. It, 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 it is right. And so they had to use their, their uh, uh, the, the, the plants that they had operating. So they, they got pressured quite, quite a bit. Okay. Um, Do you think that actually so helped the, um, help the case for geothermal on the Big Island to realize, you know, how reliable it was and, and, and how, how much they could count on geothermal if they really took up newer technology and maybe improved the location, got it, got the geothermal moved a little bit farther away from a residential and community farming area? Oh well, yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of discussion and, it, and people, you know, uh, you, especially if you talk to the employees at uh, Pune Geothermal, what you'll find is that the employees are, are, are very comfortable that they're doing uh, the best thing they can do for the community. So, um, that's what I, I normally do when I'm trying to find out what's going on with, with a particular company. I, I, I just ask the workers. And, and I gotta say, you know, the, the workers at the Pune Geothermal are, are, are very, very um, uh, convinced that um, they're doing the right thing for the community. Well, that's important. I know that, you know, we try and do a lot of things uh, here in the islands and each island has its own personality and its, its own culture. And a lot of times we get pushback from the community, a lot of times it's just because the people don't understand or they're, they're fearful of um, the technology itself or they're, they're worried about um, traffic or they're worried about safety issues. Um, they're worried about what would happen if a tsunami hit and, you know, and impacted that, that technology, what would happen there. They're kind of afraid of the unknown, but when you have people working at that plant and they're, they're up to speed on the safety and they're familiar with all the procedures, and they're comfortable, they, they're, it's better for them to talk to their own neighbors and, and make their own community comfortable than to have some stranger come in and, and try and tell them, yeah, everything's fine. So uh, I think that's a good, a good way to approach it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the concerns immediately and, and for the last, you know, 20 years has been local. Uh, around the area, but you know there there there's some uh, larger issues today, and the larger issues has to do with you know I saw I ended up going to the speak out conferences, and the larger issue is um, we're depending on 
uh, fossil fuels so much, and uh, we're relatively energy blind uh, as to how important um, uh, fossil fuel is uh, uh, in our economy and our, in our way of life. So when you when you start to realize that um, these concerns are so important, the worldwide concerns, then and you take a look back down to to your immediate neighborhood and have to compare uh, what what is most important to everybody. You start to see that the concern that's facing us in the future is something that all of us are, are should be concerned about. All of us on, uh, in, on Hawaii Island as well, as well as the whole state, because fossil fuel is 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 going to is the finite resource. Basically, that's what it is. Yeah. And it won't last forever. Yeah, I know. And you, you sent me those videos from um, Professor Hoggins, and uh, and I've talked about them several times on the show. We're going to take a quick break here and get back with Richard and talk a little bit more about uh, the future of the Big Island and how things are looking uh, 10, 20 years from now. And I think some of that's going to revolve around hydrogen. So we'll be back in 60 seconds. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. <laughs> Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man on my lunch hour as usual here on a beautiful Friday in Honolulu. Um, we're talking to Richard Ha on the Big Island, and um, Richard left off talking a little bit about some uh, recent conversations he do, he's had with uh, Professor Hoggins from uh, Minnesota, I believe, University of Minnesota. Anyway, he makes a great point, uh, the professor does, about how all of us are really energy blind, and we really don't appreciate the, everything that we do today requires energy. And one analogy he makes is that, uh, you know, two, three hundred years ago, people used about 200 watts of energy or had about that much energy uh, requirement every day. But today, with all of our technology, all the things we use, our vehicles, our, our transportation, our jets, our shipping food and things across the globe, we're actually using about 100 times as much or, or close to 100 times as much energy as the earliest man was using to go out and hunt and gather their own food. So we don't appreciate how much actual work goes into giving us the lifestyle that we have right now. And that entire energy capability, that, that hundredfold increase, is all because of cheap oil. And that cheap oil is a finite commodity, and eventually it's going to get more expensive than it is now, and it's going to run out. In fact, just an article from the Internet today and from the news last night Russia has a contaminated pipeline, and that pipeline carries about 1% of all the oil that the, uh, that, the nation, that the world needs to operate. So imagine if a, a bigger system, maybe there's a, a bigger war in the Middle East, and 15 or 20 or 30% of the world's oil gets tied up and is unavailable, and now all of a sudden there's pressure on the U.S. to provide its oil to the world, and the price starts creeping up on everybody's oil because there's a supply shortage, that's when all of a sudden you start to realize that the price of all your food goes up. As we started off with his show with Richard saying he's got to buy fertilizer, he's, he's got to move his uh, equipment, he's got to have tractors going, that all focuses back on heart, hydrocarbon fuels, fossil fuels. And that price starts to drive the whole world economy uh, crazy when that 
price of energy goes up. So we need to start looking and being more responsible about uh, being efficient with energy and also what's, what we're sourcing our energy with. So we talked about hydroelectric and, and geothermal on the Big Island being two great sources of what they call baseload power or firm power that doesn't fluctuate with the sun and the wind that are also available besides all the sun and the wind that we have to provide not only the Big Island but our whole state with energy. But when it comes to moving energy around, you've got only a couple choices. You've got batteries, you've got hydrogen, you've got, you can, I guess, move it in heat if you wanted to, but there's really only limited ways you can move an energy uh, as either a liquid fuel or uh, stored in batteries or as a, as a gas. And one of the, the ways we're looking at storing energy on, on, in the state here is hydrogen. Well, it's one of my favorite subjects. Richard, talk a little bit about, you know, have, you've been up to Blue Planet Research and been with Paul at his shop. Um, tell us a little bit about what you think about hydrogen. Uh, well, you know, I, I like the idea about hydrogen because, um, like you say, you know, it, it can be moved around, you know, in, in, in uh, containers, you know, like propane, but, you know, adjusted to make it work. You can use it for transportation, hydrogen fuel cell. Um, versus electricity where you would have to use a heavy battery you could use a smaller tank and still get longer range and and uh you won't take as long to to uh, fill up and um uh, as compared to batteries um yeah so so and, and plus when you use uh hydrogen your emissions is just um, heat and um uh, water water vapor so there's no pollutants that go up in the air from, from transportation. Uh, so there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, advantages to using uh, hydrogen in the future, in the future of declining uh, uh, oil supply. And the further you go into the future, the more important hydrogen becomes. So, uh, so the question really is now, how soon are we going to see the effect of rising oil prices? You know, right now we see it happening a little bit, yeah. But in about two years or so, it's, it's my guess that, that uh, uh, we'll we'll start to really appreciate how how, how difficult it is, and how how expensive it is to go get uh, the oil, and then the prices will start to rise. So it's prudent for us to to start to move toward uh, hydrogen as soon as we can. Uh, I I agree, and in fact, I have. I had a guest on last week, and we were talking a little bit about this, and he pointed out uh, something that I, I haven't thought of, and, and I don't think the professor even included in his talk, but you know, if, if we wait until the crisis point and decide now we need to move into hydrogen for a, an alternative uh, energy source, well, you don't have the equipment built to make the hydrogen or the vehicles and the other stuff you, to use the hydrogen. So now you have to make all that equipment or make all that infrastructure and when you make it, you have to use the expensive fossil fuel that's in crisis. You know, that you're, so you're building the infrastructure at the most expensive time. And the time to really start building the infrastructure is now, even though it's not maybe as competitive price-wise, but you can't afford to wait till the crisis to start building the infrastructure to replace such a huge and important um, piece of our economy as uh, what the fossil fuel energy sources. So, you know, we're talking about not waiting for the crisis and don't wait for the crisis to start transitioning to this, this hydrogen energy because the infrastructure build will be too expensive at that point. So, you know, how are we going to start moving on the big island, Richard, to, to get things going early rather than waiting until the price of oil jumps so high? Yeah, you know, and um, so we have to determine uh, ahead of time how many refueling stations do we need? And then the, the, and how much will it cost? And um, how do we start moving in that direction? Because what is happening um, just recently is that the um, hydrogen refueling stations don't have to be as large as we thought, at least what I thought um, three years ago when I, when I was last involved in, in this hydrogen uh, 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 subject. So if we can start off small, and then add modules as we go up, we can get a start that, that's uh, not as expensive. Uh, so that's kind of where things are today. today. So it's, it's a possibility to, 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 to get it started earlier rather 
rather than having to to, to wait. Uh, yeah, it, it's better to, to start moving now. That's a, that's a great point because the one one of the great things about hydrogen is it's really scalable. Uh, they make hydrogen fuel cells small enough to run a cell phone on, and then they make them big enough to, to go to grids, um, generate power for an electric grid, and everything in between. And same with the generation, to make the hydrogen and dispense it in vehicles, you can get units that cost less than $100,000 that will make the hydrogen, compress it, clean it, store it, and dispense it into your vehicle. And if it's for uh, like a household use or a small business use, that's less than $100,000 for that entire production equipment. So, so it can be scaled really easily. Well, Richard, I tell you what, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here. And uh, I'm going to leave the last 30 seconds or 45 seconds to you to just talk about your vision of, of the Big Island uh, coming up, energy-wise. Yeah, so, so we're looking at a future of declining um, uh, oil supplies and, and rising costs. And, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of scary, actually. But you know, in Hawaii, we are extremely, extremely lucky to have geothermal because this is a totally separated source of energy from oil. You know, and, and the heat that's coming out of the volcano, the cost of that heat will not change from today. It's free. Yeah, so it's, it's just the infrastructure. But the infrastructure is, is nothing you, 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 compared to having to drill it in a foreign country and then bring it all the way to Hawaii and then set up equipment to, to convert it to, to usage. We, we actually have it here on the big island and it's, we're going to be over the hotspot for 500,000 years. So uh, the future is, is, it looks bright. What is really important for us here in Hawaii is to leverage our, uh, uh, who we are and, and who we are are is, you know, from our history, is, is aloha and sustainability. And that's what the world is starting to look back at as being tremendously important, but that's what our ancestors did from, from forever, you know? So it, it's something we know. Well, Richard, I, I think that's words of wisdom that really need to take to heart because I agree with you, and I think in the future, the world's going to be looking at Hawaii on how we did it because we're, we're going to do it first. We're going to be there before pretty much anybody else. And I'm looking forward to working with you on the Big Island to make it happen. So thanks for being our guest today. Absolutely. And I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks when I'm on the Big Island. All right. Thank you. Okay, Richard. And thanks to all of viewers out there for watching Think Tech and Stand Energy Man this Friday. And uh, next Friday, I probably won't be here. I'm going to be in D.C. Maybe you can Skype me in or something. But uh, we're still working on that. But until next time, aloha.